Okay, part two. <laughs> so uh, I was asked to speak about um, taking libraries to the next level. So uh, first we were speaking about um, what you can do just with a small collection and thinking strategically. And I want to really advance it now to uh, working with strategic partnerships, especially with archives and museums, um, but other opportunities as well. Uh, you know, I was talking about <clears throat> our colleagues being on the other side of the island, and we, I don't know how it is here, but in the States, we don't really go over there very much, even though you can hear the drums at night, and you can, uh, you know, you, you have an awareness that they're over there kind of in the same situation as you. And um, I'm really interested in exploring this because I think that the users in the library are not really caring where information or resources are coming from um, with everybody is sort of like uh, embarking on digitization projects and uh, it's not so important what collection something is in if they're not going in person to use it. It's just something they're accessing online, right? Uh, when you think about our uh, institutions, they're very different in some ways. So. In the States, uh, when you talk about accreditation, um, it's a program in the school, in the, in the um, MLS, Masters of Library Science program, that receives the accreditation. But in, if you're an archivist, you're individually accredited. And in museums, it's the institution that's accredited. So this really drives some of the differences in how we even look at each other in terms of who has uh, expertise and uh, I think in, historically it has limited um, or put up some barriers between cooperation or at least sharing some approaches to um, uh, surviving some challenges. And the way we uh, look at and think about um, our users uh, are really different. So first of all, we have a lot of different terminology, at least in the States. Um, it was really cool to call them customers for a while, and I never liked that word. Um, but patron is kind of an old-fashioned word, and user is, is kind of very literal. They're using our resources. Some are visitors, some are clients. So we're all using different terminology, and even within different kinds of libraries. So in the top right, you can see you know, this is where you're encountering um, members of that outside world. Uh, at, a, at a desk, but in an archive, you're really working more one-on-one -on -one with this um, special material, and in the bottom right, you know, it's more of a group experience, and maybe you're not encountering anybody from uh, the staff at all. But we are all uh, working, uh, uh, dealing with some larger societal trends uh, that the users are bringing in the door, uh, having some expectation that uh, we are um, embracing the challenges brought up by some new trends uh, in society at large. So, for example, you see open data in the upper right. Um, so many governments now, they want to be transparent and they have the ability to put as much information out there as possible uh, in the name of good government and you can see where your money is being spent and they have the technology to do this. But on the other side is privacy concerns, right? So um, we just got in trouble for uh, having some documents that were scanned and put online from some time ago, but uh, nobody thought about somebody's phone number and an email address in the um, attendee list. So uh, that person discovered it, and you know you have to go through a redaction process or maybe editing these documents uh, beforehand. That was never a concern before. So. Overall, libraries, archives, museums, what we call the LAM institutions, we're really, um, really sharing some high-level uh, similarities. And these are the challenges of uh, gathering the resources we need for our users, making them pay attention to us, and realizing how important we are. Uh, financial support, always, right? Uh, the incredible exponential growth in resources, and how to house it, and how to store it, and provide access to it and proving that we exist every day because more people, um, younger people, if we're not training them right, think that everything comes through their computer from the 
Google gnomes out there that are just uh, working their magic. So I'm going to talk about a few models for collaboration where a rising tide can lift all boats and we can work with other institutions outside of libraries to prove our worth in innovative ways. So one model is the cross-sector event. And I talked to you in the morning about uh, LA as subject at the network of all the libraries, archives, and museums in Southern California whose collections relate to history mostly. And every October we have that archives bazaar um, and you see the map and the image there. And this has been a really successful model. It was replicated by the city of Austin in Texas. They even stole our name without permission, but it's a good thing. Um, and now San Francisco and Chicago are doing the same thing to bring together very different types of organizations uh, in the same day to share their resources and create like a celebration around the resources and the collections. Uh, another model is, uh, taking it a step further, is the research portal. So on the right, on the left is a screenshot from the Texas history, the portal to Texas history. So this is universities and libraries and archives and museums pooling their resources together in sort of a one-stop shopping where you can actually execute the research in one place and behind the um, front end is some sort of crosswalks between systems that have different fields mapped to each other. So it's facilitating this uh, not knowing where resources reside, but just bringing it to you, not just uh, in a website like my LAS subject page, which has a directory, and then you have to search each collection separately. Here, you're just pulling it all together in one. And the same thing goes for Chicago. As I mentioned, they have um, separate institutions creating another entity where they all reside together online. It's a great uh, you know, discovery opportunity. If you don't know about another collection, you can go to one and link into all of them. Yet another model is the um, scholarly research platform. This is really fascinating. I've been um, looking a lot at the city of Atlanta. Um, this is hosted by Emory University in Atlanta, and they are facilitating kind of quasi-academic and citizen research. So you have a mixture of um, resources that are put out there, and then they can, uh, digital resources, and they can be um, accessed by anybody to create new knowledge. People are doing map layering or looking at census data and mashing it up with other resources they find elsewhere and actually publish their research here and have academics access it and create a conversation between the public who may be an enthusiast about a particular neighborhood or a particular topic um, in the city's development and work with academics from there. It's also a place where academics can identify each other working on the same project or the same subject and maybe avoiding to duplicate somebody else's research. Another interesting uh, research platform is about the city of Shanghai in China. But I put this here because this is not actually Chinese website. This is all people in France that are studying Shanghai that share a platform together. So when you go online, you know, you can encounter people from all over the world. And so um, this is really interesting that the, all of the Chinese uh, history scholars looking at this part of China that are in France are creating a website, which is in English, ironically, international language. So um, very strange, but I think we're going to see more and more of this. Uh, I mentioned History Pin this morning. So this is the mapping, a photo mapping tool with the chronological data layer. And they have special projects. It's not just for you to put your photos online on a map. Uh, this is a collaborative effort. The example here on the left, you see a map of San Francisco Bay. Uh, it was the 150th anniversary of the Port of San Francisco. And they invited all of the libraries and archives and museums in the area, plus the public, to upload their photos, tell some stories about them, and you can see what sorts of things were happening um, from disparate collections in a particular area uh, to share a common platform. And a really cool part of this uh, uh, project was the like mysteries 
page. So you had like uh, an interesting photo of a boat or maybe the shoreline and you didn't know exactly where it was in the bay. And you may have information, maybe you live there or your grandmother told you a story about some building <clears throat> or some ship and you can participate. You don't have content to upload, but you have information in your head or from your family that you can help solve the mysteries of what is there. So this sort of participation by citizens that are not employed in a library, an archive, or a museum is really radical, I think. It's really turning upside down our concept of what is an amateur and what is an expert. The first crowdsourcing project was started actually in, I think, the 18th century in England. They were trying to discover the how to determine the latitude, longitude, the longitude, I always get them mixed up, uh, for sailors. <clears throat> and the British government offered a prize to somebody to determine uh, how you find that out. And they were expecting, OK, some great scientist like Isaac Newton is going to be the person who figures this out. It actually was determined by an ant a clockmaker in rural England uh, came up with the answer. So putting these questions out to the public has a long history. We're only sort of now like rediscovering it in online environment. Uh, and it's great because it's really taking, it's not taking away our expertise necessarily, but it's a value added thing. The more brains you put to something, the better it's going to be. So we can really cultivate this um, citizen expertise in our communities and take advantage of it. Um, there's many examples I can't go into, but uh, I'm really interested in uh, this one is, uh, and ones like this, which are citizen scientist support. So there's a project called Old Weather uh, that has many different institutions from many countries participating in it, and they're asking the public to transcribe the logs from ships, describing what the day was like, what the weather was like, and they're putting it into some format where they can use this to look at historical aspects of climate change. So it has real current day and future use. It's not just solely for a more complete history. They're looking at trends that are part of um, other resources to be brought together to look at what's happening with climate change around the world. And for the, to market uh, projects like this and say, oh, you can be a part of history, it's really powerful because you're part of describing the history, but you're going to be part of history solving something today and in the future as well. Well, that didn't work out very well. Uh, <laughs> there's supposed to be two images here. Another aspect of this crowdsourcing is help the library and also archives and museums supporting uh, groups in the community who want to coalesce around each other to begin with. So. Uh, there is supposed to be an image on the left about um, Afro, um, uh, Afro Wiki, and I can't remember the name of it because I'm not seeing it, but it's uh, people of African descent who can come together to embellish Wikipedia entries related to um, people of African descent. And the same thing for the LGBT community. Um, fully um, fleshing out entries related to um, topics related to this group. So you're not only creating, uh, supporting the creation of more detailed information, but you're supporting the organizations that can coalesce around a particular fe um, feature or uh, activity itself. And in turn, this is creating new communities. Um, it should, uh, this is in the resource list. It's fascinating to read about the Crowd Consortium organization. Uh, this was started by some universities on the east coast of the United States, as well as some larger museums uh, and archives and libraries that are all in, engaged in crowdsourcing projects. And so they are getting together to talk about best practices and how do you sustain participation and not have somebody say, oh, I want, to, I want to identify photographs or transcribe documents, and then two weeks later they 
go off and do something else interesting? How do you keep them going? So they're talking about gamification and contests and rewards programs for your loyalty where you maybe if you transcribe <clears throat> uh, 100 pages, you get tickets to the opening of the next museum exhibit to the VIP evening or something like that. The, <clears throat> I wanted to just show you the New York Public Library had developed a, a lab program where they had a whole suite of different uh, crowdsourcing activities and they were getting expertise from other archives and museums related to things in their collection to facilitate engaging the public using the resources as well as describing uh, what is in the photos, transcribing things from, this is the uh, historic restaurant menus from New York going back to the very late 1700s, I believe. So food is the great you know, equalizer among you know, everybody. Everybody has to eat and there's a lot of foodies. So they, this was one of their first projects to really get people using the library and feeling comfortable engaging with librarians from the start. And then they expanded out from there they um, offered a program where you can become a building inspector. So they were scanning the plans for different buildings in the city, but the outline, the footprint of the building was not always clear. So you could go online and choose different uh, blueprints and you drag your cursor to make the outline of the building so that they can overlay uh, the like a city block from different eras so you can see what was in that particular block or business over the years and cr uh, creates new knowledge that way. Um, the Map Warper project was rendering the maps in the collection at the same uh, scale. So you could, create, you could identify new relationships. Um, they were doing this a little bit in Los Angeles. They were looking at where pedestrians were being hit by cars and they were also looking at, somebody took another map and looked at where you do not have a dedicated left turn lane and there was a relationship between, you know, if you don't have a place to turn left, you're gonna, you might get run over. So that has a real world implication from something very historical. So New York is creating this uh, space-time directory. They're taking all of this data and layering it so that you can travel through time. It's sort of like the, Google Earth from 100 years ago, 200 years ago, and really give you a three-dimensional immersive experience on another level that's really fascinating. This is all very sophisticated. It takes a lot of time and effort to set up, but it's, I'm including it as just a, a, things to think about that we have so many new directions that we can move in in terms of user engagement. This is Linda Stone. She was a children's librarian. She's now a tech writer. And I love this quote. I think it's more true now than when she said this 20 years ago. We live in a state of continuous partial attention. It's like uh, you know, when somebody's walking with their phone and they're on Twitter and they're, they think they're so connected, but they're you know, walking in front of a car. You know, they're really not connected at all. Um, the biggest challenge of all with all of this new technology to do all these great projects is really getting everybody focused on the same page and finding those strategic partners to move together in one direction. But how can we compete for eyeballs when everybody is so distracted? I, I was thinking about, uh, you know, historically these uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics and how today, you know, how much have we really advanced in 4,000 years? <laughs> I think we're kind of moving backwards. <laughs> uh, but you, you, you can find those partners out there, and it takes meetings like this and just those casual conversations to, with, with somebody in, uh, from the other side of the island to talk about you know, challenges or just some crazy idea, and maybe they have like a real practical way to implement it. They're working out in the gym, and they're saying, let's, uh, let's take a quick social media break. <laughs> So there's a few areas for convergence, uh, and these are the areas where I do feel like libraries and other partners can coalesce to move together um, and create that relevancy that we all seek beyond just maintaining the status quo. There's emerging technologies, the question of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and sustainability. 
So there's a couple of ways to think about um, emerging technology. I think this, this day is probably not too far off. <laughs> I don't know, the, the, the age of the QR code maybe has come and gone, but this, uh, this I think could possibly still happen. Uh, <laughs> raise your hand if you're familiar with the 23 things concept. Okay, more hands, a lot of hands, okay. so. Uh, we just had the 20th anniversary of this um, program. It wasn't a, a training program, it was a learning, self-paced learning program. And uh, Helene Blowers, she um, developed this great, uh, you know, uh, opportunity to learn about new tools and social media, and it was exactly replicated in archives, 23 things to learn about archives, and also some museums and some other people working in technology-related fields. Um, direct transfer from one sector to another, from libraries to archives. Um, but we can learn a lot from what's happening in the other sectors without it being a direct transfer. So uh, are there any beacon technology applications that anybody in the audience is using? So in libraries, um, a beacon can serve as a sort of a micro-location service. Um, they're installed in the, in the stacks, and if you have the app on your phone and you're looking at a book about um, one subject, you can get pinged and alerted to, hey, you're looking in this area, there's books, because of the classification system, there's books on a similar subject five rows over there that are separated, and it's sort of like a, a virtual see also reference, okay? So libraries are using this to tell you where something else is of interest. Museums are using them a different way. Uh, if sometimes you have something on the wall in a museum and there's just too much interesting information to put it all there and be a distraction on the wall, when you want people to focus on the, the painting or whatever it is, it can ping you to read additional information and you can bookmark it to read it later. So even though there's some very different applications, uh, we can share knowledge about the implementation, the management, the migration of the data, or the creation of the apps may be useful to be talking to our, our, uh, the other tribe and the other side of the island. Um, more and more we want our uh, collections to reflect everybody that we serve. We claim to serve everybody. Um, and we want to uh, look at all diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, not just for the public, for the staff. It's a part of succession planning. And with these crowdsourcing projects, now people are participating from anywhere in the world. So we have two issues with that that are interesting to think about. Uh, you have uh, the perspectives of people from outside of your area coming in, which may not reflect your community, um, because people are participating from all over. And at what point do you determine that you have successfully included the perspectives of other people? So for instance, when you are looking at Wikipedia, like now it's kind of accepted as more and more of a legitimate resource because everything has to be substantiated, but the number of, the percentage of women Editors, anyone want to guess? 50%? No, it's 9%. So you may have accurate information, but there's misinformation by omission, okay? So some topics related to different people is totally just not there. Maybe what's there is very accurate, but missing a lot. Um, I won't talk too much about this, but it's uh, important to really think about the difference between equality and equity. You see the, the picture on the right, everyone's equal, everyone is standing on a box, but it's not really, everybody's not having the same experience, right? So this is better in the middle, it's, fair, it's more fair for the person on the right, but why not just remove the barriers for everybody in the first place? And sustainability, um, there's many different types of sustainability. I'm really fascinated by the um, archivists um, against climate change. They're looking at institutions that are threatened by rising waters. We have a lot of libraries, archives, and museums that are very near the water, maybe underwater soon. Could be happening, you know, not any time, but you know, it's something to think about. Uh, in the future as well as um, 
you know, things related to succession planning and energy as well. I'm just going to touch on a couple of things where we can find inspiration from outside the library, from archives. For instance, how archives are dealing with social justice issues. So we have uh, Occupy Wall Street was a recent social movement. Um, we had some civil unrest in the U.S. related to Ferguson, Missouri, and Baltimore. There were some police shootings that triggered a very strong reaction in the community. Uh, immediately, the archives in, in Maryland, they, the Maryland Historical Society and University said, hey, send us your photos, send us your video, uh, oral history, whatever you have, and we need to collect that on the spot because now, with everybody so loving social media, they're, you know, they upload it to their Facebook and they uh, send it to a friend and then they delete it and then it's gone. And this is like great primary resource right away. So they want people to think of the library or the archive or the museum first, in addition to their own personal social network. Do you know where this photo is taken? Uh, I found a picture of the Women's March in Oslo. <laughs> but what happened to all of the signs? Did they go get put in the trash that day? When I was in Los Angeles at the Women's March, there were archivists gathering the signs. And this happened in Washington, DC also. But how many signs do you take? Do you take all of them? Do you take one of each kind? Do you take uh, the one that's not, didn't have coffee spilled on it? Like, how do you, know, you know, it's a whole new way of collecting, but it's important because it's right there in front of us. And so this is an opportunity to ask the historians, the sociologists, the anthropologists, or the psychologists, or whomever, what is the research you are going to need in the future? This is an opportunity to network outside the library and ask them what is, what do you see being a value down the road? And we can act now to take that responsibility. I think it's really important. Uh, I talked a little bit about privacy and transparency. Now they're teaching classes in the archival training in my uh, information studies school. Um, it's pretty interesting for libraries too. And this is uh, an example of great inspiration from museums. This is Amy Herman. She wrote a book called, I don't want to misquote the name of the book. It's called Visual Intelligence. Sharpen your, I'm so sorry, sharpen your perception and change your life. Now, that sounds like everybody should read that. Who doesn't want to be like more perceptive? So what she does is she takes police officers into museums. And she teaches them about perception. And she says, hey, what do you see in this painting? And so one guy says, oh, I see a woman and a man. They're sitting together having dinner. And some other guy says, maybe, <clears throat> well, you know, the painting is really about the guy behind them because it looks like there's more light on him and he's the focal point of the painting. And maybe a third person says, no, that's not really what the artist is trying to say, that's what's happening, but that's not the main point. And there's this conversation about what you're seeing and just the way she's using the museum in a totally new way to show people how to see things differently. So when the police encounter a crime scene or arrive when something is happening, they don't go with their first instinct of what they're seeing. And it's going to make it be, it's, a, it's an opportunity for the museums to play a completely new role in making a better place to live for everybody. And I think there's some application here for libraries and archives. I don't know what it is yet, but there's some completely new roles out there for us. But uh, there's a link to the book, and it's really interesting to hear her interviewed. Um, I think there's a link to an interview with her as well. So the questions I'm asking are, is it replicable, is it scalable, and is it sustainable? When I look at what I have done and experimented with and what I'm looking at in terms of case studies elsewhere, I always think about these things if I'm sharing them with people like you guys today. What can you take away and manage to make larger or smaller, or does it translate to another environment? These are the questions we have to ask all the time. Uh, I encourage you to read from the resource list about um, Shannon Mattern wrote this really cool article called Public Information, and she is an urban planner, 
and she advocates for librarians playing a role in every aspect of modern society. Who thinks that's a good idea? <laughs> so putting librarians on the planning commission and archivists in the police academy, um, because information is playing such an important role in everybody's life, um, not just in government, but in every aspect of what we do. We can't have enough of us everywhere. So placing us strategically in other places, at least we can be ambassadors for responsible information. This is a chart which is uh, too complicated to uh, talk about too much, but it is a, a handout that's on your resource list. And this is what I um, have been looking at with um, my colleagues from the, um, I was appointed to a federal commission of libraries, archives, and museums looking at each other's cultures to see if there are some shared professional development and continuing education opportunities that uh, we should be sharing with each other. So whether you are a new librarian or at the end of your career or in a small institution or a large institution, I think, I believe more and more that leadership is not about management at all. It's really about wherever you are uh, and wherever you work, you have an opportunity to um, play a role in being innovative, coming up with an idea, um, trying to just think outside of the box. And I'm sorry. Uh, it can happen anywhere, but it's all, it's all our responsibility together. And, and I wanted to ask if everybody saw the Academy Awards this year or is familiar with what happened at the end of the Academy Awards this year. Hands, if you know what happened with the award for the best picture of the year. Okay, so that was crazy. Um, <laughs> the next day, a very, very, very small library in the state of Wisconsin in a very small town, uh, uh, somebody that worked in this library created a book display of, uh, in the children's department based on what happened the night before. Oh my goodness, it's gone. Oh, I am so disappointed. This is not showing up. I have to tell you what it is. Okay, I have a photo. That's the only photo that didn't show up. So they created a book display with only three books the, together, three children's books. The first one is called Adventures in La La Land. And the second book's titled Oops. And the third book is titled Moonlight. And this photo went viral throughout the libraries and then some newspapers picked it up and pretty much everybody, I don't want to say everybody in the United States, but a lot of people saw this image. And um, it brought attention to this town and to the library, but more importantly to the, li the community that that library is in, that hey, this is a creative place that has a sense of humor, that's fun, and this was a paraprofessional working in this environment Three books, one idea, spread across the country. And that is the kind of leadership that I think it's important for us to uh, embrace and stick our neck out, because nobody's going to do it for us. And so if we can identify strategic partners and um, really work with our colleagues and try to um, look for you know, really live our values. You know, we talk about uh, cultivating lifelong learners. Why are we not going to partnering with every hospital in our community and giving a newborn baby library card? Because if we talk about lifelong learning, it starts on day one, right? It's free, and uh, we already give library cards away, so it's an opportunity to do something where you say, we're committed to you from your first moments. And I leave you with this quote. Uh, the preeminent journalist in the United States was Walter Cronkite, and he did an ad campaign for American Library Association. Whatever the cost of our libraries, the price is cheap compared to an ignorant nation, and this is true now more than ever. And um, so I hope maybe I come back in a year or in the future, and I hear about all sorts of great stuff that you guys are doing and uh, learn from you, and if any of you Come to Los Angeles. Um, the tacos and margaritas are on me. <laughs> uh, 
just two very quick things. This is the link uh, here uh, with a, links to a lot of the resources I talked about. It's bit.ly bit.ly slash Bicknell hyphen 2016 dash APR, but maybe you can go out in a follow-up email and uh, smile, you're on. <laughs> <laughs> a, colleague of my, a colleague said, take pictures because if we don't see it, it didn't happen, so. <laughs> Thank you, this has been a real pleasure, I appreciate it. <laughs>